if, if you get into the the way a lot of traditional journals work these days it's just ripe for disruption right like it's researchers pay thousands of dollars taxpayer dollars for from their you know taxpayer funded uh, grants for their research from the NIH for instance and then they're spending that money to publish their science so that it can be shared with others and then other people can't access it because it's behind a paywall and they have to pay to access it so none of this makes sense Hi, today I'm speaking with Jocelyn Pearl. Jocelyn is a molecular and cellular biologist who spent the past decade working in gene editing and epigenomic engineering. She also hosts a podcast that interviews female scientists that we've linked below. In the past years, she's become interested in how science funding and research could become more decentralized. She subsequently co-founded LabDAO with Nicholas Rintor, who's also been on the show. Their collective provides open tools and infrastructure for computational life science research. Among other things, we discuss the pros and cons of centralization in the biotech industry, how building up biotechs has largely differed from tech startups in the past, and the incentive challenges to aligning academia with new organizational and funding models. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy our conversation. So, Jocelyn, thanks so much for taking the time to speak today. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I'm excited to be here. So first off, um, could you maybe give us a primer on the decentralized biotech movement? Broadly, what kind of technological, economic, and cultural changes have led to the idea of decentralized biotech? And what are maybe the organizational principles of that community? Sure. So decentralized biotech, as far as I know, the, the term kind of came out of a uh, chat group on the Vita Dow Discord server. Um, and there were a number of people talking about this idea in these, you know, online communities, essentially people, a lot of people who had background in drug discovery, um, investors, scientists, and broadly speaking, people were interested in like, how do we do drug development uh, collectively, globally, uh, over the web? Um, and how do we, you know, take the steps towards uh, advancing new treatments. Um, and so from that, a number of new DAOs formed. Uh, LabDAO uh, was among them. So with my co-founders, um, Nicholas and Ari, we were asking these questions around how do we break out this black box of biotech? Because so much science happens behind closed doors in these companies. And we were wondering how could we build an online community where we incentivize people to share results, where we um, helped people connect with other scientists, help people get the tools they needed to do drug development. Um, so those were kind of the, the early themes and the discussions that were happening. Um, as far as the principles, I mean, I think part of the draw for a lot of people from the canonical industry side or academic side was like, could we create a whole new system, something outside of these entrenched silos and ivory towers of universities and, you know, academic labs and industry um, and biotech or pharma companies um, where so little of the knowledge is shared, uh, even after a drug gets approved, for instance. Um, so that was all really exciting, drew a lot of people in and a lot of people who are interested in, like, building entirely new ways of doing this type of drug development. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe go into a scenario in which it would be complicated or, or problematic for a biopharma company that's maybe gotten a drug approved, like a traditional, um, maybe, as you call it, like entrenched one. Um, what's the problem precisely about them maybe keeping that IP for themselves? Um, how is that actually like a negative thing that you're kind of reacting against? Yeah, I think of it more I, I heard someone say once that transparency takes work. And I think that's true for a lot of things like, you know, even coding, for instance, you know, having good documentation, sharing knowledge in a way that's accessible to others takes a lot of work. Um, and I think within companies or within traditional like biotech pharma, um, you're not incentivized to share the work in the same way that you are in an academic lab, for instance, in the sense of sharing things via publications. 
um, you of course are patenting your um, research as it goes on to protect that IP. Um, but there's so much on the back end that happens as far as like which experiments are being done, which CROs are you using? Um, you know, even kind of like early toxicity data or preclinical data that might be useful to other people. Um, and what we've seen within these kind of smaller rare disease sectors is that sometimes people even use uh, FOIA requests to get access to that information because so much of that is getting filed with the FDA, for instance. But I think it's just not currently incentivized. It's not really like, um, you know, it's not some kind of uh, necessarily like impetus on the company. And I don't think it's just that people are busy and they don't necessarily have time to like put this information out in the world in such a way that others can access it. But I think the questions we were asking at LabDAO was like, how could we incentivize that? Like if we had, you know, if we use tokens as a way of talking about money or incentives, like could you create a community of drug developers where you receive tokens or you received a payment for sharing knowledge? And therefore, you're more incentivized. Now, at the end of the day, like, what is that price tag? We don't know. I mean, someone would need to do the analysis because when you compare it to the price tag of the drug that you're developing and if it gets approved, the scale is just so different uh, that I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure how it, how it will work, but definitely questions that we were interested in. Mm -hmm. What then was maybe like, the most fascinating idea to you that drew you to decentralized science in the first place or further toward de decentralization um, in general and then maybe like science um, later on uh, connected to your background? Yeah, my first, one of the earliest conversations um, I had with my friend Ben Hills about scientific publishing and how we could apply, you know, blockchain technology, NFTs, um, some of these concepts from the crypto world to scientific publishing in an effort to, you know, both fund more science or make things better for researchers. If, if you get into the, the way a lot of traditional journals work these days, it's just ripe for disruption, right? Like it's um, researchers pay thousands of dollars, taxpayer dollars for from their, you know, taxpayer funded uh, grants for their research from the NIH, for instance. And then they're spending that money to publish their science so that it can be shared with others. And then other people can't access it because it's behind a paywall and they have to pay to access it. So none of this makes sense, you know, and I think it's like within our, you know, corporate and capital world as things like as people can make more money off of something, they will continue to do that um, mm -hmm. in my view. And so we we were having these conversations of like, how do we disrupt this system? How do we apply this new technology to thinking about making things better for how research is shared? Um, now that's a, you know, there's a lot of issues within that and like disrupting that's really hard. It's um, a very complicated problem. And I think there what I learned from working on that within open access DAO um, was that there are a lot of good ideas, but it's really hard to um, actualize them. And a lot of it comes down to funding too. Like you need to have the money to um, build new platforms and attract people to those platforms and encourage people to publish on new platforms and encourage people not to publish on traditional in traditional journals. Um, so it's a very like uh, complex task and you know so far there haven't been a lot of front runners uh in this space but research hub is a good one they've been around for several years um patrick joyce and and brian armstrong leading that one um great platform recommend people check that out uh you know arcadia is one that i call out they're an institute where they actually don't want their researchers to be publishing in traditional journals and they publish them on their website publish all of their work on their website um to make sure that it's really open and accessible um, and incorporate things like Twitter comments, for instance. So, you know, so many great ideas happening in this space around scientific publishing. And um, Astera, actually, this other institute just put out a call for looking for entrepreneurs and residents to help develop these ideas. And they ac actually are looking for ideas through their website. So recommend people check that out, too. Um, but yeah, it, it was fun to start to chat with people about these problems and 
think about them in a different way. And I think broadly speaking, blockchain or, you know, however you want to describe this sector attracted a lot of people who were thinking differently about longstanding problems in, in science and academia. Mm -hmm. And even on the kind of collaborating or staying close to academia front, obviously academia has its built out ecosystems like journals, grants, university partnerships, um, such, and they've like been kind of built out over the span of decades. So every new organization, right? And so far as it wants to become a real aid to scientific progress, um, in some way has to stay linked with that traditional world, um, be it for access or tacit knowledge or expert judgment. Um, how do you think then about the incentives that uh, kind of academics might have not necessarily um, to get on board entirely with publishing maybe in your journal or such, but even with collaborating with you for your projects to succeed? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. It's one I run into when I've been talking about these ideas in these kind of meta science circles, um, especially from the academic side. I think there there is a lot of uh, negative um, perception around these ideas. Um, primarily, I think that's a reputation problem with crypto in general. Um, I think they see it as a weak signal and, and they want to kind of avoid it altogether. Um, but what was the first part of your question? Sorry, I kind of got off track. Oh yeah, sure, sure. No, that was a mouthful. Um, just how you think about what incentivizes academics to the value add. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I guess the, the way I think about it is that one of the biggest values of the DSI movement in general is that there were there are a lot of people talking about these themes of cross collaboration, open science, um, founder led biotech. Um, there were these kind of like a lot of people writing and talking about these ideas. And I think at the end of the day, if what academics get out of this is that they are more aware of the option to publish somewhere else or they're aware of the activists in the community that are talking about these ideas and they're aware of you know ways that people are garnering interest in changing things for the better um that's a huge ad like i think seeing you know after working on open access DAO and then seeing the white house put out um the executive order for all of you know taxpayer funded science to be open access by 2025 um that to me was like a win because we'd been working on this problem but things are already so much better like we already have this backing of the government support to say like no this does need to change and who knows like which conversations led to that happening but i think it's important to you know, be out there communicating this and saying like, hey, things should change and things can change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was curious, um, about a year and a half ago, you wrote um, a guide to decentralized biotech for A16Z's publication, Future. Um, I pulled out some excerpts of that article that I'd like to ask you more about. Um, to start off, you put into context the rise of decentralized approaches to biotech and state that recent changes related to funding trends and increasingly globalized workforce, the real estate market and the popularity of decentralized models in other industries have underscored the limits of centralization as a dominant approach. Could you maybe spell out those changes further? Like what changes in the real estate market or funding trends and so on have actually uh, kind of led to a move toward decentralization? Yeah, I wrote that at kind of a peak during the pandemic with regards to um, primarily COVID drug development uh, booming. And there were, was very little lab space, for instance, in Boston and in Seattle and in, in, in a lot of these main biopharma hubs in the United States. And so what I was observing was that uh, new founders were actually, you know, 
recruiting people across multiple cities, um, having more decentralized teams, um, working more remotely, working with CROs. Uh, there was one founder I interviewed who, you know, didn't have any science happening on their site in San Francisco. They worked with CROs for all of it. Um, and some of the names for this type of uh, organization are like virtual, a virtual biotech, for instance. Um, but yeah, it was that time. It was like that heyday of COVID drug development. There was very little space in the predominant locations where biopharma usually happens. Um, at the same time, we've observed on the technology side an increase in globalization, like the ability to talk to you right now while you're in Lisbon, um, the ability to work collaboratively online in these communities. I mean, that's not necessarily new, but I think with the pandemic and with so many people being inside, it was even more aggressive um, in its level in our lives. Um, and there was also this increase in electronic lab notebooks, which I think is important for this space because so much of our work and our um, the language of what we're doing uh, is described in these notebooks. So to be able to do that online, uh, to be able to have cloud labs, to be able to have more automated labs, you know, I don't think we're quite there yet, but there, there are just so many more options um, for people to do this type of work in a decentralized way. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the limits of, I suppose, sharing online or working, collaborating online together um, as it relates to especially, you just mentioned kind of lab notebooks. And uh, I sometimes find it interesting to think about kind of the tacit knowledge that seems to underlie a lot of research. Um, the stuff that has to kind of be maybe learned, some would argue, uh, by just observing someone um, that's a senior to you um, and like seeing how they do it, even if they can't quite put into words how they perform an experiment and such. Um, have you like come across good ways to increase kind of the sharing of tacit knowledge or do you feel like mm. that's just a wall that exists and is kind of impenetrable? It's just like a limit um, of cl cross collaboration like that? Yeah. So. I, I'm glad you brought this up because number one, I, I think I definitely believe that there is a value to centralized teams as well, especially when it comes to doing hard science and complex science. Um, and I think we can all understand the difference between working in person with a team versus working online um, and, and understand that there might be something missing uh when we're doing that um and i think especially for startups or like i said these hard problems it's even more important to be co-located and be able to walk up to someone's desk and ask them a question and um collaborate on ideas you know whiteboarding that's always been a big uh part of my work as as a early stage researcher in biotech um so not having that really online uh, can can be a drawback for sure. Um, you had another question. Sorry. No, no, I'll get um, just. Yeah, I was interested in how you think about the limits uh, of sharing tacit knowledge, but yeah. Oh, right. Um, so sorry. I like have only had a sip of coffee. Um, That's fine. It's very so, early. So sharing tacit knowledge is really important for, for scientific work because let's take, for example, uh, I'm going to get a new cell line. I'm going to order it from ATCC and I'm going to get this vial of cells and I'm going to need to thaw it and passage it and take care of these cells so I can run experiments on them. When I go to do that, there's often protocols on um, ATCC itself might publish a protocol for how to take care of the cells. Um, there might be papers I'm referencing that have protocols. Um, but then there's a lot of additional information about how to take care of those cells that might not be in the protocol. Uh, so one place that my friend Guy Roken started uh, is called SciFind, and it's a platform for sharing those kind of minute details of methods um, and helping each other work through issues. So the way it works is people post questions on the platform and others can respond. It's really awesome. I really recommend people check it out. 
And, you know, ResearchGate was kind of an early predecessor to that. I think it's fallen somewhat out of um, fashion. I, I don't know if you heard about uh, people sharing their scientific PDFs on ResearchGate and then getting attacked by these big uh, publishing companies like Elsevier. But I think that actually really had a pretty negative effect on their reputation, at least in my view. Um, mm. But yeah, I think it's a, a really great uh, question and, and hopefully some of these new platforms help people um, identify the information they need to, to carry out their research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in that same piece that I mentioned, um, you also say, say that we are also starting to see scientists and entrepreneurs form new types of decentralized teams to accomplish shared goals. Within the biotech sector, a key question is whether these networks lead to functional cures. Could you maybe speak to some successes and failures of new scientist entrepreneur configurations that you've come across so far? Yeah, I have to call out. I mean, this this company is not um, really connected to blockchain technology at all, but I think is living the values of Web3 and of decentralized work, which is Perlara. Um, so Ethan Perlstein leads a, a group of scientists from all over the world, and they help um, guide cure development for rare disease families and foundations. And it's really impressive uh, what they've been able to do. And then they, they publish these really beautiful cure roadmaps that they write for these families on their sub stack. So it's all open and accessible. Anyone else can read it and kind of understand um, the way they're thinking about these problems and uh, yeah, encourage people to check it out. Uh, they're, Just briefly, they're what's, awesome. what are they doing uh, in, in particular, maybe for listeners who aren't familiar? Yeah, sorry. So um, essentially, they'll be approached by a family with a rare disease. So let's say um, these parents have a child who has been diagnosed with a genetic mutation that's causing neurodevelopmental delays, um, causing all kinds of symptoms that this family is dealing with, they're not quite sure where to go from here. Um, because in the traditional medical system, you know, let's say there's only a handful of people who have this mutation in the world. Um, they might not even know each other yet. So a lot of times these uh, families are finding other people who are suffering from the same mutation online and then forming foundations together to advance the research on their own disease. Um, so they'll work with Perlara to do a lot of background research on the mutation, what it might be doing, identify if the mutation or the gene is present in other animal models so that they can start to do research with animal models. Um, and yeah, they really kind of like oversee this early stage drug development process. And actually, uh, one of the very first families that Ethan worked with, um, that drug is now in a phase three trial. So it's pretty impressive um, what they've been able to do for, for some of these uh, families. Yeah. And in closing that piece uh, for A6 and Z, you write that if the only thing we have to lose are the gated centralized systems we've known for years, that's all the more reason to test out new ones. Um, I'm curious about this. What precisely do we lose? when we abandon those old systems? Um, what might be the Chesterton's fences, the hidden useful aspects of centralization uh, that we might lose if we remove the kind of interconnected serpents annoyances? Um, we've kind of been touching upon this, I guess, from, from different angles so far, but what might be the strong case for centralization? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot uh, after you know having different conversations with people who I, I think are passionate about building new things, but might not be thinking as critically about what we do lose. Um, when it comes to science, I think the thing I've been worried about is the training aspect that happens in academia. Um, and the fact that we do have these um, really wonderful training programs essentially to bring people in to um, train them via the PhD program um, and teach them science in such a rigorous way. And that's something, you know, I see people mentoring others in these online communities, but I just feel like it's not quite the same as having 
you know, a co cohort of individuals that are in the same location that are going through the same trials together um, and learning together in, in that way. So I'd love to see more of that happening in the DSI sector and, you know, more people mentoring, more people developing programs. Um, I know Deep Science Ventures just started this really interesting PhD program. Um, like, I just, yeah, I just worry because I think at the end of the day, the gating factor is going to be the people who have the knowledge to advance these things. And we're going to need more of those people who um, can kind of hold all of that information and, and connect the dots. And um, yeah, I, I what? go ahead. Yeah, sorry, um, on the Deep Science Ventures PhD program, could you just explain more about, about what that is? Yeah, actually, I... <laughs> we can also link it afterwards. Yeah, we, we should link it. Um, so one of the early DSI folks, uh, young folks I've worked with um, through through these communities, Brett Kornick, he's actually entering into the program. But my understanding is it's kind of a decentralized PhD. Um, I Like, I'm not sure. You, I, I think you don't have to live in one place. I... I'm happy to be corrected on the details, but when I first read about it, I was very excited to see they were doing this. So, okay, cool. Yeah. Are there are there any things that you feel like you wish you would have known maybe ten years ago, um, five years ago, uh, in terms of just yourself working, as I understand it, um, in first traditional academia and then um, kind of in biopharma as well? Um, are there any things for either of these? Um, that were kind of big conceptual changes you went through uh, that you feel like are worth sharing? Yeah, I guess one of the things I've realized over the last few years is that um, people get very comfortable with the way things are. And it, and it is somewhat rare to encounter people who want to change things. And it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of... Um, you know, a lot of discomfort in a way to uh, to work towards something different. Um, and I think that's something I didn't really realize. Like, I think when I was in grad school, I kind of thought like, oh, everybody wants it to be better. Everybody wants it to be different. Um, but yeah, there aren't mm -hmm. that many people in the world. So if that's what you want to be doing, and if you want to be building something different and something new um just hold on to the people who are going down that path with you and what is kind of the implicit knowledge in your field um that you feel like holds true generally but it's not explicitly stated what has to be learned in you um through experience by everyone who's entering the field uh with no good reason say it could be written down uh, or shared more publicly it's not necessarily uh part of that maybe be a tacit knowledge that just can't be really like um, put into words. Um, I'd be curious to hear your answer for both traditional uh, biotech and also decentralized organizations if you have any. Mm. I guess <laughs> when it comes down to like the actual physical science, depending on the sector you're working in, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pick out the two main areas I work in, molecular biology and cellular biology and cell engineering. Um, there is a lot that's unsaid. Like there's a lot of like unspoken um, ways of thinking about what you're doing. It, it's more It's more similar to the physical act of painting than you might expect in the sense that you're making hundreds of thousands of micro decisions each day as you go through the course of an experiment, um, as you handle cells, as you handle liquids, you mix them, um, you're vortexing, centrifuging, whatever. Um, you know, there's so much there that uh, I think you just have to learn through doing and through making mistakes. Um, and then it has more of a feeling, right? Like when you're doing it well, <laughs> Obviously, you know when something bad happens, like, oh, I dropped yeah. the tube or, you know, mix the wrong reagent and now the experiment's done. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of physical knowledge that uh, is kind of hard to describe. 
Yeah. Um, and DSI obviously is much more participatory than traditional academia when it comes to funding research projects. Um, this is another question I had uh, that kind of gets at the, you know, uh, academia um, new institution divide on both the given end of say DAO participants and receiving end of researchers. How do you think about ensuring an accurate pass on of a person's reputation and more broadly maintaining scientific quality? Say mm -hmm. if a researcher is applying for funding, um, how then if you're kind of working outside of the system and in a democratic matter of funding um, or voting on which projects to fund, how do you make sure you're funding uh, good projects and yeah. uh, projects of people who have integrity or proven track record? Yeah, I mean, that's where some of the um, identity work in the Ethereum sector is really interesting, right? Like proof of identity, um, you know, I'll, to call out a few projects, Gitcoin Passport is one when we're talking about decentralized work, especially in the open software sector, you're able to um, see a person's GitHub, for instance, and, and their work um, and allow that to be proof of work. Um, on the science side, so LabDAO is working on something like this. Uh, we have this computational platform called Plex. Uh, where you can run a number of um, these drug development tools off of your laptop. So you can perform protein folding, uh, drug docking. Um, you know, they have, have a, a number of different tools there. And then you can actually um, mint your work as proof of science. Uh, so it's kind of a cute way of um, uh, establishing proof that you, you did this task. Um, but I think one of the things a lot of people in this space talk about is like applying you know the um god i'm blanking on the word applying the you know concept of ownership via the blockchain and allowing people to see like okay this person established this idea back in 2011 and then they wrote up this article describing their research in 2012. And then this other person described this other thing, you know, in 2013. I think those are ways that people are thinking about um, establishing like scientific provenance. That's the mm -hmm. word I'm looking for. <laughs> Sorry. Between you and the people that you work with or close to, um, what are the most contentious topics that repeat themselves when you're debating uh, your problem or your work? What's your main disagreement, um, mm. say in the LabDAO context, or maybe even in the startup yeah. you're working for right now? Yeah, within LabDAO, um, a lot of conversations are had around the role of community and how much we invest in that versus building a product. So. Um, you know, perhaps the DSI space, or I don't know if you want to call it um, the collective intelligence space, has been focused on the community side of things. Um, and as far as like real products that have been built in the space, they're, you know, we can name them probably on two hands. Um, so I definitely admire Nicholas for leading a team that's focused on building. Um, but I do find the the community aspect of these platforms to be really exciting and enriching. And like I mentioned, the mentorship aspect, you know, that's part of what's been a value to me is I can step into Discord servers and help people with problems that they're grappling with um on the drug development side so yeah it's a it's a tough problem when you have a small team and you're trying to navigate how you delineate um running that organization and you know there are no right answers mm -hmm. in that piece that you wrote um you also mentioned uh briefly that uh a trend that we're seeing now is kind of the founder led. I think you also mentioned that earlier in the conversation, founder led um, kind of biotech startups, uh, where, as I understand it, 
um, the main emphasis is on younger founders that maybe have less experience um, and legitimizing them also building companies uh, in biotech. I mean, we've seen that a lot with software startups, obviously, in the last uh, few decades where, you know, the founder has maybe dropped out of college and now is like building a company and when it really works, you know, um, they make a movie of him. But why do you think the biotech industry favors founding teams that have decades of experience, um, much more so than, you know, tech has traditionally? Like, what might be the strong case for seasoned executives um, in that area? Yeah, I mean, the strong case, someone did an analysis recently of the last, you know, couple dozen drugs that got approved by the FDA and whether or not their CEOs were seasoned executives or not. And I think strong majority of the time they are seasoned executives. Um, I think that's definitely the trend. I think it, drug development's really hard and complicated and there are so many hoops to jump through. Um, a lot of it, like I mentioned, is behind closed doors. It's about who you know, you understand, you know, which CROs to work with, you understand what regulators are looking for. Um, you have, you know, decades of experience doing that. Um, so yeah, I, I totally get the other side of the argument, but I think the argument I, I like to make is like, why, why not? Like, why not see what these PhDs can do with their drug that they developed during graduate school? Um, and there was, there have been stories of the, the other example of, you know, two undergrads from Brown starting a, a biotech to develop an ALS drug that just got approved. Um, so yeah, you know, we'll see. It's just, it's all a hard game. So my attitude is like, get everybody in and motivate them and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And can you think of any important questions that I'm not asked of you today um, that you feel like you want to address? Um, maybe I'll ask you a question if, if I may. I'm sure. curious, you know, you've been involved in VitaDAO, you've been, uh, you know, kind of following the space for several years now. Um, I'm just curious how you're thinking about decentralized work and decentralized science mm. looking back. <laughs> yeah, I, I think to me, what's become more and more salient, um, kind of following along in the last few years, um, is just the complexity of actually changing institutions, uh, that whose like practices have really been built up over decades, maybe even centuries uh, in some in some form or another. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting ideas, um, but to me, the the thing that's maybe yeah become more and more to focus is like how do you actually you know incentivize people to the like, people being you know like very specialized academics um, that are following like a clear path um, where there's just certain practices or certain journals you have to submit to in order to, to advance um, a certain conference you have to attend. Um, how do you actually um, not kind of fall into a situation where um, you may be having a small following, but you're not really like changing systematically um, kind of the, the scientific field and, and what might be like ideas and I think people like you, for example, that have gone through grad school and are actually working in biopharma still and understand maybe um, better how that side actually looks. Um, that's that's important to to have these people in because sometimes I think um, there's a little too little emphasis on um, kind of uh, how rigid. Uh, institutions are and how hard they are to be changed and mm -hmm. um, still like also the importance maybe of certain institutions like how can we collaborate with them instead of just uh, scrap scrap scrapping them scratching them um, yeah just like abolishing them um, because that's probably uh, not going to happen anytime soon uh, 
as I think about it. Uh, but I'm, I'm also very curious to be proven wrong about this. Um, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm more interested, I suppose. And I, I don't have like a definite uh, judgment on uh, how, how much, you know, like academia and maybe these new scientific, like these decentralized scientific efforts are working, like whether or not they could you know, go into more collaboration. Um, I, I was quite impressed um, by, for example, Pfizer investing in Vidada. I think that's like mm -hmm. a strong signal of like, you know, at least like a traditional biopharma company kind of uh, taking chances on a new player and uh, things like that. I'm, I'm much more interested in now, like, where are you actually collaborating with traditional institutions and how are you actually thinking of, uh, yeah, maybe like changing the system sometimes also from the inside instead of mm -hmm. just creating like a separate kind of little um, thing that isn't quite connected, but also can't quite profit from the good that's coming out of traditional institutions. Yeah. Great points. Well, thanks so much for speaking. Um, this was really interesting and we'll link a bunch of stuff that uh, we mentioned in terms of uh, new organizations, um, Gitcoin passports and Labdo uh, and everything else you're working on. Uh, we'll link that in the show notes. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Leah. Yeah, thank you.